welcome again to this session. And just to start off, I had this picture at the beginning of session one, and it's the question again we ask ourselves, whose hands are those? If they're my hands, how am I holding Mother Earth? Is it gently or am I squeezing it? Am I squeezing Mother Earth? How are businesses, politicians, our institutions holding Mother Earth? And so this is again a reflective session. It's not too factual. So just again, to be in touch with your heart and what your heart is saying. Just to revise, this was one of the slides I had up last time. All earth is governed by laws we did not devise, laws we cannot revise, laws to which we too are subject. God works through the laws and processes of nature. Earth does not belong to us, we belong to earth, we come from it, we are sustained by it, and in the end, we return to it. How does an evolving understanding of the emerging universe story impact on how we live? How do we make the principles of differentiation, interiority, and communion a reality in our lives? That was one of the ones we had up last week. And then we ended with the two type of worldviews. And I asked you to go into breakout rooms to, dis to discuss those. And most of us would admit that we somewhere in the middle, our hearts and deeper aspirations call us to the right hand side, but very often our choices and practices take us to the left hand side. So now we're gonna ask, you know, what do we do? How do we respond to what we have seen? And we can be very flippant and say, so what, that's it. Or we can pick and choose, or we can embrace the advance in our understanding that science presents us with in order to deepen our response to what lies at the heart of it. And I think that is what's being asked of us. So what I'm going to concentrate on now on the two last questions, what is possible for the future? And then where do we go from here? Now, 2015 was a time of global action. First of all, we had the Sustainable Development Goals and we're not gonna go into them. We also had the Paris Climate Agreement, but more importantly is we had Pope Francis's Laudato Si document, care of our common home. And in the document, he's got six chapters. And if you look at them, it's what we're trying to discuss, what has been happening to our common home, the gospel of creation, the human roots of the ecological crisis, integral ecology, lines of approach and action, and more importantly, ec ecological education and spirituality. Pope Francis speaks about spirituality, is at the heart of it all. That's the biggest and deepest challenge. And yeah, as one of the sayings, when we can see God reflected in all that exists, our hearts are moved to praise the Lord for all his creatures and to worship in union with them. Isn't that beautiful? Another saying from Laudato Si, the universe unfolds in God who fills it completely. Hence, there is a mystical meaning to be found in a leaf, in a mountain trail, in a dewdrop, in a poor person's face. And there's the challenge, the mystical meaning at the heart of creation. Now, Pope Francis speaks about an integral ecology approach takes us to the heart of what it is to be human. And in Laudato Si, he emphasizes four topics, science, ethics, spirituality, and action. And now, if we put it in a type of cyclical diagram, we are asked to see scientifically, evaluate ethically, reflect spiritually, and then act effectively. 
Pope Francis is one of the few that bring in the idea of reflect spiritually. Very often we see the scientific, the science tells us what is happening and then we go and act without even judging whether what our actions are ethically correct. Some of the mitigation measures that are being propagated might not be ethically correct. But Pope Francis is asking us to go deeper into our hearts, which lies at the challenge and reflect spiritually and then act effectively. And I think as people of faith, this is what our, our great work is, as Thomas Berry would say, this is our great work. This is our sacred story. Also in Laudato Si, we got the Laudato Si action platform, response to the cry of the poor, ecological economics, adoption of simple lifestyles, ecological education, ecological spirituality, community engagement and participatory action, and response to the cry of the earth. There is the big challenge of Laudato Si. So in a pictorial form, <clears throat> we are being challenged to move from that duality and patriarchal and hierarchical approach that we spoke about last session, which is the kingship approach with the human male being on top, even to go to stewardship, but to go further than stewardship and to be challenged towards kinship. In that movie we did last, session, the unfolding universe story. We are kith and king of, ev of, of, of kith and kin of everything that exists on the planet. And that's who we've got to be in relationship with. So what is possible for the future? There's the big challenge. What Pope Francis is asking of us, what the, the, the Sustainable Development Goals are asking of us, what the Paris Climate Change Accord is asking of us, what the COP meetings are asking of us, of our leaders, of our political leaders, of business, all institutions. So now we're going to concentrate on where do we go from here? Now, no spirituality is valid if it is simply a personal piosity or devotion. Every genuine spirituality must result in action. And from a spiritual point of view, God calls us to mystical activism, to bring beauty and healing to our world, to Mother Earth, to our planet. I want you to remember that last sentence. God calls us to mystical activism to bring beauty and healing to our world. We'll go deeper into this now. So there was one young lady who took some type of action, Greta, and what she did morphed into a worldwide movement of young people. I'm going to put up on the screen now something that's very, very challenging. After World War II, this economist, Victor Lebeau, challenged our world. Our enormously productive economy demands that we make consumption our way of life, that we convert the buying and use of goods into rituals, that we seek our spiritual satisfaction, our ego satisfaction in consumption. We need things consumed, burned up, replaced and discarded at an ever accelerating rate. Now, if you consider that, that has been highly successful in our world to get us to the situation of today. We seek our spiritual satisfaction, our ego satisfaction in consumption. And we discard, burn up and replace at an ever accelerating rate. 
and our manufacturing industries and our fashion systems, et cetera, have all bought into this. If we think of what we buy and what we discard and what breaks and we replace and what breaks and we replace, what we discard in terms of fast fashion, this is what our marketing and our manufacturing and our sales have done to us, our whole sales industry. And our world is at this particular state. Where are the temples of worship? Go to the shopping malls and see how people gather. Go to the huge sports stadiums and see how people gather. The temples of worship. And now I'm going to show you a, a movie, a little movie clip by Julia Butterfly Hill on disposability consciousness. But I just have to go out and set the, the, the sound correctly. <clears throat> so I have to stop sharing. So now we'll start. I believe that one of the biggest examples of separation syndrome in our lives is how we have such a profound disposability consciousness in this culture. And I use the example of when you say you're going to throw something away, where's away? There's no such thing. And where away actually is, is social justice issues and environmental justice issues. Every plastic bag, plastic cup, plastic to-go container, that is the petroleum complex in Africa, Ecuador, Colombia, Alaska, you name it. Every paper bag, paper plate, paper napkin, that is a forest. Every thing that is called waste or disposable is the ways in which we are saying that it is acceptable to throw our planet and its people away. When I started thinking about disposability consciousness, I went and asked a lot of Native people that I know if in their original language if they had any words for waste, disposable, or trash. And I have yet to find in any traditional language words for waste, disposable, or trash. Because all traditional knowledge knows that there's no such thing. I saw a great sign once that said, it's only called waste if you're not using it properly. <laughs> and we have a wasteful consciousness. We have a disposability consciousness. We've lost our connection to the sacred. And for me, disposables are one of the huge magnifiers of how we've lost our connection to the sacred. Because you don't walk up to a tree and go, wow, I wonder how many paper plates I could get out of that puppy. <laughs> you know, We don't think that way, but our actions are doing that. I invite people to look at everything in their lives and look at where does waste mentality and disposability consciousness, how has it infiltrated my life? And I see it as one of the ways in which we all have internalized oppression. Because those forms of oppression are disconnect. Those forms of disconnect, they work best when they just subtly weave themselves into the fabric of our lives, where we just take it for granted that we're going to go to the coffee shop and get coffee that came from an exploited community somewhere where a forest was destroyed for a monoculture, put it in a paper cup that used to be a forest, put a plastic lid on top of it that used to be an indigenous community somewhere in a beautiful area, drink it, and then throw it away where it goes back and pollutes a, na a nature community or a human community at the end. I am so fiercely passionate about it because I know in my heart that as long as we are trashing the planet and trashing each other, a healthy and holistic and healed world is not possible. We cannot have peace on the earth unless we also have peace with the earth. Our disposability consciousness is a weapon of mass destruction. I have walked in the clear cuts. I have been in the oil pits. I have seen the weapons of mass destruction called disposability consciousness. 
And if we want to heal the world, we have to begin to choose tools of mass compassion where we are reusing everything, where we are reconnecting to riding our bike, getting out and walking, using less energy, not leaving lights on here and there and not thinking about it. When I first came to the city after coming down from the tree, I was walking around in the neighborhood one day and I noticed all these lights on in homes that weren't people in homes where people weren't even there. <clears throat> and I know that it's because of that mentality that we were taught that, you know, the big scary criminals will think somebody's home if there's a light on. I'm like, if I lived in a tree for two years and I know nobody's home, I bet those big scary criminals know <laughs> nobody's home. And how and I say that and I laugh because it's that fear mentality that makes us to be these wasteful consumers. And I saw that that is this this disposability consciousness that we are just we're just throwing everything away and that we are afraid of everything and that that's manifest everywhere in our lives. I invite people to recognize the joy in simplicity, the power in simplicity, because when people hear that I'm a joyous vegan, car free, walk, ride bike as often as I can, touring in a bus powered by vegetable oil. A lot of times people think, well, that must be boring. But, you know, is, the food must be bland. You must be really sad and upset. I'm like, do I look it? <laughs> like, it is the most joyful, life-affirming choice to, to let go of disposability consciousness and to reclaim every moment, every day, every choice as a step towards healing. So that was a reflective movie by Julia Butterfly Hill. Julia spent two years up a redwood tree in California protesting against the cutting down of these ancient trees. And she said their disposability consciousness, disposability is a weapon of mass destruction. And if you reflect on that, that is true because the disposables are killing our planet and killing life. And we have to become weapons, if you don't like that word, people of mass compassion. And her great saying is, there will be no peace on earth until there is peace with the earth. And that to me sums it all up. When we respect Mother Earth and make peace with Mother Earth, and allow Mother Earth to bring forth life and keep life going without blowing up our planet, killing biological life and each other. When we make peace that way, there will be peace on Earth. So I'm going to give you a moment now just to reflect and put your thoughts in the chat box. So welcome back, everyone. Thank you for your reflections in the chat. Here's another saying from Julia. It is when we look at all life and we feel that sacred connection that we begin to change how we live in the world. And as a result, it will begin to change how others live in the world. St. Francis of Assisi did exactly that. He didn't profess to, to fight against unjust laws or uh, dogmas of the church. He just chose to live another way and show that to the world. Now I want to read this quote very close, very quietly with you. It's by Wendell Berry, an American author. We cannot live harmlessly. To live, we must daily break the body and shed the blood of creation. When we do this knowingly, skillfully, reverently, it is a sacrament. When we do it ignorantly, greedily, clumsily, destructively, it is desecration. In such a desecration, 
we condemn ourselves to spiritual and moral loneliness and others to want. Now that language speaks as if it's Eucharistically applicable to me. It is Eucharistic language. We must daily break the body and shed the blood of creation reverently. So the challenge to me is how do we live Eucharistically? The Eucharist is not a pious practice or a devotion. It's not an end product. It's a way of life. And that's what was Jesus was about. He had an open table fellowship. He shared with everyone. So our challenge today is how do we live Eucharistically? Quality of life is not quantity of stuff. Rethink, reduce, reuse, recycle, and any other R's you know. Sustainability, preservation of biodiversity, soil, water, gardening, planting trees, social and environmental justice, advocacy, leadership, awareness raising, education, environmental rights, law. How do we bring all this into our law systems? Green chemistry, zero waste closed loop production, renewable energy, disinvestment in fossil fuels and extractive industries, local living economies, and how we engage with our world, join a group, form a group, involve women groups and children. This to me is living Eucharistically. It's preserving the life of our planet and bringing forth new life. So now I'm just going to give you a moment to reflect on that in the chat box. Um, it's just... So we, we move on now. Thomas Berry said, the human has become the desolation of the earth. All human institutions, political, commercial, governmental, social, legal, education, university, religious, and their professions and programs must be judged primarily by the extent to which they ignore or inhibit or foster a mutually enhancing human earth relationship. That is very, very wide and very challenging. So the challenge about Eucharistic way of life is the following. What do we, what do you bring to the table of life each day? Break open and share. And does it ignore or inhibit or foster a mutually enhancing human earth relationship and foster the reign of God in, with, and through the body of Christ. And the body of Christ is our universe where God reveals God's self. Now I want you just to look at that and reflect on what I put up there quietly to yourself. What do you bring to the table of life each day, break open and share that fosters the reign of God.
So now I'm going to show you just two little movies challenging us and what is holding us back. I just need to go out to get the sound right. It's 3.23 in the morning, and I'm awake, because my great-great-grandchildren won't let me sleep. My great-great-grandchildren ask me in dreams, what did you do while the planet was plundered? What did you do when the earth was unraveling? Surely you did something when the season started failing, as the mammals, reptiles, birds were all dying? Did you fill the streets with protest when democracy was stolen? What did you do once you knew? So there is the challenge. Some people say we are living off the credit cards of our great, great, great grandchildren. What did you do once you knew? So what is holding us back? And this is another short movie by Julia Butterfly Hill. When I think about how we've gotten to this place of being so separated, from the earth and from each other and from our choices. It seems like there's many prongs that have gotten us to this point. I think one of the core elements though is actually quite simple, which is fear. And fear is simple and profound, just like love is simple and profound. And fear will drive us to make choices that our hearts don't long to make, that our spirits don't long to make. Fear will, will shut down the voice of the heart and spirit and collapse us into beings without meaning and without value. I see in this culture in particular how that manifests is our addiction to comfortability. We are, an, we are birthing an addict society. I went through a time in my life where I was a major drug and alcohol addict. And so I know on a very real level what addiction is. And as a society, we are being birthed into an addiction culture where you need consumerism, you need comfortability, and you go through the same withdrawals and this, all these same things that you go through as a as a drug addict or an alcoholic and we i see even the most conscious among us making the most unconscious choices out of our addiction and comfortability i love using the example of the caterpillar becoming the butterfly because the caterpillar has got a pretty cool life you know it's chill it lives on its food source doesn't have too many threats it's usually camouflaged so that whatever birds or things might come after it it's you know it's slightly safe and then it has this weird calling that defies description that says there's something more for you <laughs> and there's no rationale or reasoning and if we are in many ways we are that caterpillar going man i don't want to leave this leaf this is so cool i got it made here you know and and yet there's this deeper calling that tells the caterpillar you there's something more for you and then the caterpillar has to trust this great unknown, this great mystery. And fear keeps us from trusting the great mystery within ourselves. For me, the divine is the great mystery, that we are all manifestations of this great mystery. I take a breath and I am amazed at the great mystery that just allowed me to breathe and everything that happened for that magic to happen. But this caterpillar follows the great mystery and then it pulls the cocoon from within itself. It goes into its deepest depths and pulls this cocoon out and then wraps itself in it. And we are afraid of what's inside of ourselves. When something comes up that we don't like, 
click on the television, go out to eat, go party with friends, go shopping. Whatever it is that we don't have to take a good hard look at what's inside of ourselves. But the caterpillar knows that there's something more, even though there's no reason for it, and goes, okay, I'm going to do this work. It's uncomfortable, but I'm going to do this work. And then it wraps itself in there, and it's tight, and it's dark, and there's nowhere to run, and there's no way to sidetrack itself. It's just dealing with its innermost depths. And that process liquefies it. That's not a comfortable, touchy-feely kind of thing, right? <laughs> that's not like, oh, and it's all going to be better. Like, that's some hardcore work. And... Then there's a point, though, where that cocoon gets comfortable, too. It might be a little cramped and dark in there, and I think I see that happening in our evolution as people. It gets a little cramped and dark in there, but it's also comfortable and safe now. We've created this little world around us that we can just call ourselves enlightened and stay there versus taking that enlightenment and having the courage to take it out into a world that's not like anything we can imagine. And the last thing that happens after the caterpillar begins to liquefy is its head pops off. And then its head absorbs into this liquid being that it's becoming. And if you take a cell from that liquid before its head pops off, it only reproduces part of a butterfly. And after its head incorporates into its entire soupy being, you can take a cell, and any cell, and it recreates an entire new butterfly. And then the caterpillar has to push through the barriers of comfortability again and trust that whatever is outside that, that space is going to be a magical world. And then it takes a moment to, of grace to fan its wings, and then it takes a leap. And I think that our fear consistently keeps us from that process, whether it's at the leaf stage or in the, cat, in the cocoon stage or where we, we get out and we flap our wings and say, that edge looks a little scary. I'm just going to chill here. <laughs> you know? So now I invite you for a moment to reflect and put your reflection maybe in the chat box. What are your deepest fears? What is holding you back? What is holding us back? We know what we are called to do, this deeper calling, this mysterious calling, and yet it gets to our heads and we rationalize it and then the fear takes over and we don't follow what our deeper calling is. And we make wrongful choices and wrong actions that our hearts don't tell us to do. So just reflect on that movie. And what would your reflection be if you want to put something in the chat box? So now we come to the final slide and I've put up a whole lot of statements and I'll ask you to reflect on the following and then to go into the chat boxes that Tina will send you into to discuss what you've heard during this presentation, anything that has struck you to share and you could put some reflections in the chat box if you wish to do so. So over the two sessions, the earth is primary, the human is secondary. Human rights flow out of earth rights. We put all our law systems into human rights, but not into earth rights. We knew we need to move from anthropocentrism to cosmocentrism. We are cosmological human beings. We are a community of subjects, not a collection of objects. That's Thomas Berry. We are the universe in the form of a human being. We are the universe reflecting on itself. Everything is in some way sacramental. Everything is sacred. Only a sense of the sacred will save us. Where do we touch the sacred? And where does the sacred touch us? Pope Francis emphasized that the challenge of our time is a spiritual challenge. We need a spiritual action, spiritual way of life to solve our problems. He emphasized that so strongly. 
And then what we are called to, God calls us to mystical activism. That's so beautiful, mystical activism, to bring beauty and healing to our world. We are asked to be mystics, and at the same time to be activists. The famous Buddhist monk Thich Nhat Hanh used to say, we have to take time to be and to interbe. Do we give our time to be mystics and then to follow through with that in activism? Thank Go you. Ahead. Based on our sharing, um... Something that came out strongly is um, to embark on advocacy and justice for the whole of creation, including social life. Thank you. Thank you, James. <clears throat> right, go ahead, Julius. Yeah, something that uh, we talked about is that uh, Whatever we have talked, uh, we have discussed today is not new to us. But the challenge is uh, why am I not doing what I'm supposed to do? And I think that's just a, uh, it calls for a change of attitude and be more active, not only depending on theory, but also be participative in whatever I'm saying. Thank you. Right, John, you're welcome. Hello, everybody, and uh, thank you very much, Terry. Um, I just maybe I thought it was very powerful drawing it back today toward to the Eucharist, and um, you know that emphasis on the Eucharist as being not just communion with Christ or with our fellow brothers and sisters, but actually with all creation. And I think that was something really profound today that uh, really, really struck me and that I'm going to go away with. So thank you very much. Thank you, John. Thank you for your reflections in the chat, John. Uh, go ahead, Jeff. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Terry. Yes, I agree with John. I, I Taking away that Eucharistic aspect is something I haven't quite thought about as much or heard as heard as much as tonight. One of the ways I like to think about it all the time is the fact that we everything is interconnected, that phrase of interconnected, um, which is implied in everything that's been said, but the word I didn't hear used, that we're interconnected with each other and with earth and with God as co-creators, that everything is connected, just seems to say a lot. You can trace anything we do or don't do to a problem with connectedness. Thank you. Uh, just for myself, just from the chat, I love what Peter Darling just wrote. Um, I have to move past the fear of losing out if I'm not part of this consumeristic society. Move past the fear of losing out if I'm not part of consumerism. I think that was a, a great saying, Peter. And the fear of failure was mentioned by somebody also. Um, and Steve Rocha quoted Nelson Mandela, our deepest fear is that we are, we fear that we are in inadequate, but we are powerful beyond measure if we look deep into our hearts. Wonderful, thank you, Steve, for that. Um, about joining a group, it's hard to do it by yourself and especially involve women and children. They are so powerful. Um, somebody else uh, remarked on Wendell Berry's quote that we cannot live harmlessly. And let's face it, that is true. We have to break the body and shed the blood of creation each day just to live. But how do we do it? Do we do it reverently, sacramentally, or is it desecration? And in that we condemn ourselves to moral loneliness and uh, just isolation. So thank you for that. Felicia? Yes, Felicia, over to you. I just feel that uh, 
we're called to awareness, uh, not just a, a kind of a haphazard awareness, but a constant awareness of uh, creation, its beauty, its uh, sacredness, and of course, the sacredness of others, people too. And uh, if we had that constant awareness, I think we would move into action. But the fact is that we, we move in and out of awareness. Sometimes we're very aware, like at this seminar, but other times it our, the business of life just uh, makes it go away. And I, I liked the phrase that uh, the ladies spoke when she said, throw away, where is a way um, uh, that a way is here, that we don't really throw anything away. It's just there under our feet. And th these kinds of awarenesses are very, very important, I found. And thank you very, very much. It's beautiful. And our group here in WOW are uh, going to try to use it uh, the, the contents to, to present uh, the day of recollection at the end of August for our diocese to um, uh, get them to kick off the season of creation. So hopefully uh, that will help a lot more people. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, Lucia. Yep, very good. Okay, fire away, Steve. So Terry, you talked about mystical activism. I love that phrase because it talks about both human rights and in a way earth rights and spirituality uh what were things that could help us so it's, it can't be a, a journey from the head uh, no. all you said it just can't be a rational choice that we're making i think there's an intuitive sense to it what are ways in which we can foster an uh, a spirit of mystical communion with the universe gosh steve that is so hard <laughs> the way what i do is I'm out in nature. That's what helps me. Um, and I think we've got to take time, those simple moments of time where we are allowed, where we become still and quiet. And if we can get the young people to do that a bit more regularly and just realize that there's something more than technological whiz stuff around them. There's something deeper going on. Even to lie on the ground and look up at the sky and wonder what the hang is going on up there, you know, at night or the stars or something. So I, one of those things is just to take time to realize there's more, there's mystery somewhere. And that deeper challenge in our hearts then moves us to what you're doing with the kids, the activism, you know. But we, I think we've got to take time to be mystics, give ourselves a chance to do that, you know to realize awe and mystery somewhere, which would be very hard for young people, I think, you know, awe and mystery, those words. <laughs> but it's a lifelong process, I think, every day of our lives. Yeah. I don't even thank, thank you for that, because I think sometimes listening to a lecture like yours, we, I mean, not yours has been a little different. We think that environmental, responding to environmental issues is about activism on uh, doing. Yeah. Whereas here's about being along with doing. Yes. I like the combination of both. And, I, and mystical activism combines the two, be and do. Yeah? Yes, yeah. I think, uh, thank you for that. Thank you. I think this was okay. beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, in our group, we have a question. Would you say something about active mysticism, please? Now you're really asking me something very deep, Eddie. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose we all have to take time to be mystics in our lives. Um, that Buddhist monk, Tinknat, he often said, we have to take time to be and to interbe. So we can be mystics even in the busiest time of our lives. If we give our times, our minds time to be still. And everybody can do it in their own way. Um, and that is what we are asked to be, to get, uh, to become mystics at heart. And our heart will then ask us really deep questions that we have to go and solve and activate about. So I think that's in a very simple way trying to put that, to be deep thinkers at a heart level, to do that inner heart work, 
to be mystics, to be aware of the awe and the mystery all around us. And how do we preserve that? How do we bring about God's kingdom on earth? How do we help God reveal God's self each day? And I'd just like to bring it to the word called Eucharistically. What do you break open and share each day in your life that brings that about? I don't know if that answers your question in any way, uh, Eddie. Yeah, thank you. To, to, to give yourself time to be still. I think that's important in our busy lives today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Christy, if you can unmute yourself. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that came up in our group was the importance of reflecting. You have uh, the difference between a human being existing and one living. If you're reflecting, you can be living, not just existing. Thank you, Chris. Well said. Yes, very good. One of the reflections that came back earlier today in the, in the, in the previous session was um, this fear of losing out because we don't take part in consumerism, that I might lose out something. I might lose the, the friendship of my friends because I'm not part of this consumerist society. And that is a real big challenge also to every one of us we might lose out on something, the fear of that, to not being part. And so we are drawn irresistibly into consumerism somehow or other. We buy into it without even realizing we are in part of it. And I think what Christy has just said, to be reflecting on this all the time is so important. So that's one of the challenges, I think. <laughs> 